fireworks. And the idea is that fireworks need to uh, like finish with a crescendo of the best ones need to be at the end. And so basically this workshop is like this. And so the best ones are at the end, I think. And so here is one of the two at the end. Uh, no, then there is another talk, but uh, this was not in the original schedule. But here we have Jana and uh, Olivia in this session who are presenting some of the most, uh, I think, innovative work on plasmid that I'm aware of. So Jana, up to you. Wow, thank you. Uh, with such an introduction, <laughs> I, I hope uh, not to disappoint and to go out with a bang. Um, just to confirm, you can see my screen, the, the proper version, not the uh, presenter view. No, I see the presenter view. Okay. Okay, then let's see if we can do this differently. And again, and again. same problem. Okay. okay. Um. And now it should be okay. Fantastic. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Oh, perfect. Yeah. So today I'll present some work we've done to estimate plasmid conjugation rates. Uh, and really, my original plan was to um, present this paper that we recently published uh, in the journal Plasmid uh, on methods to estimate plasmid conjugation rates uh, from in vitro uh, liquid culture matings. Um, in this work, we compared several existing methods, uh, both on simulations and uh, experimental data, showed that there were some uh, issues with some of these existing methods, proposed uh, improved methods, and, and also tools that people can use um, to, to estimate these rates uh, easily. I will still present this work, but based on some of the discussions over the past few days, I thought I would uh, have a slightly more extended introduction uh, on why to care about conjugation rates in the first place. I think Fernando de la Cruz said that it's primarily the modelers that care about conjugation rates. Yes, we do. Um, I think for good reasons, but I think we should all care about conjugation rates also. Um, and then uh, the, in the discussion more, what do these conjugation rates in vitro mean um, for other systems or how can we translate them uh, to in vivo or environmental scales, how do they relate also to what we get from uh, genomic studies? And this is more uh, a few ideas for discussion and it, it would be nice if we still have time at the end of the session uh, to go into that. So I probably don't need to convince any of you that plasmids are interesting. And one of the big reasons why they're interesting is because uh, at least the conjugative ones can spread both horizontally and vertically. And by spreading horizontally, they can spread uh, genes, genetic material into strain backgrounds and different environments uh, where, where these genes weren't present before. Uh, and this is primarily interesting for uh, antibiotic resistance here in the context of this workshop, but also a whole range of other virulence genes and things like that. Um, and this is often seen as being in a sort of trade-off with their vertical uh, transmission. So um, horizontal transmission tends to be costly because uh, the bacteria have to uh, build the, the pilus. Um, they are uh, yeah, they, they open them up themselves up to uh, predation by phage and things like that. Um, and as, so you see uh, different sort of lifestyle modes uh, develop for certain plasmids that co-evolve more with their hosts that develop a, a lower cost uh, and perhaps also lower transfer or those that are really promiscuous. They spread far and wide in many different hosts, uh, but perhaps um, uh, are less stably maintained. And yeah, I think we've seen a bit of uh, both talks this week, people that are really interested in sort of the growth part of things. Uh, so the interactions between plasmids and their host, perhaps other mobile genetic elements within the same host, what this means for the cost that these plasmids uh, confer to the host and also uh, aspects relating to selection 
um, for the genes born by the plasmids themselves, uh, as well as some talks more focusing uh, on the infectious transfer. And I think um, what I would like to argue here is that to really get a good idea of plasmid biology on the one hand, uh, but, but also to have tools to predict sort of uh, the epidemiology, so the spread of plasmids in different environments, we need to be able to distinguish um, the spread of a plasmid that is uh, due to this horizontal component from uh, aspects that are, are more vertical. So uh, transmission of the plasmid together with its host uh, into different environments, essentially. So that's um, why I think we need really good estimates of these uh, plasmid conjugation rates. And um, here are just a few questions that one could be interested in answering uh, in, in a um, uh, experimental system where I think it's uh, important to again distinguish um, effects of environmental factors on growth versus on conjugation. So one is for instance how um, yeah, sublethal doses of antibiotics might affect plasma transfer. This is a, a question that's been studied before. Uh, there, um, and you can imagine that the antibiotics, of course, inhibit growth of some of the strains involved in transfer, um, but they might also actively uh, act on the, the um, uh, conjugation machinery, essentially, and um, the uh, 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 transcription thereof and things like this. Um, then there's other questions about what makes certain plasmids very successful. Is it their low cost or their high transfer? What is high transfer in the first place? How do we compare transfer across different plasmids, across different environments? And with that, can we also predict which plasmids are the most problematic uh, for spread? So with that, how do people uh, normally estimate plasmid transfer rates. Um, there are certain parts that are uh, quite conserved, let's say. Uh, the, the main idea behind sort of the standard protocol is you take your donor and recipient bacteria, you throw them together in whatever media uh, you're interested in using, you incubate them for some time, uh, during which uh, all the bacteria grow and uh, donors, recipients meet each other, they conjugate, the transconjugants grow, they also conjugate with recipients and so on and so on. And then after a certain amount of time, you stop this process and you somehow count the final population sizes, whether that is by uh, plating on different selective media or uh, if they're fluorescently labeled or so, you can um, attract them in a uh, different way. Um, and, and this is kind of the conserved, but, but this is also where the mess starts, because now you have these final population sizes, and what do you do with that? How does this tell you anything about the underlying dynamics uh, of plasmid transfer? And so, as I said, the first thing we did in this paper is to sort of um, catalog uh, the different methods that are out there that people have used to try to estimate uh, plasmid transfer. Um, from such mating cultures. And this is just the first half of the table uh, where I show some of these methods. And uh, you can already see sort of the, the simplest methods in a way are simple enumerations of the amount of transconjugants you find at the end of the experiment against other um, uh, bacteria involved in transfer. So uh, for instance, transconjugants over the donors, or you could say out of the recipient population, which fraction carries the plasmid. Um, and then there's other methods that are based more actively uh, on uh, understanding of the population dynamic models, either in a heuristic way uh, or a, a more direct way as I'll show in just a few slides. So, what we did here was to simulate um, certain population dynamics that we know, and then compare uh, the performance of uh, several of these different methods uh, on those simulated dynamics and see if we can recover sort of the truth that we put into it. So here I'll show you uh, a few results on a scenario where uh, all the bacterial populations have a plasmid that conjugates at exactly the same rate, but um, in uh, my different treatments, um, I get an effect on the, the growth rates of different strains that are involved. So uh, green in a way is the control, um, donors 
uh, recipients and transconjugants all have the same growth rate. Orange is now a situation in which the plasmid confers a cost um, to the bacterium that carries it. So the donors and the transconjugant strains and the purple is a scenario in which um, the recipient grows faster than the donor. So both recipients and transconjugants grow faster, for instance, because it's a different species. And if you uh, now look after either four or eight hours with this uh, transconjugant per donor method, you immediately see um, that, that we get uh, qualitatively different results. So first of all, we see that the time when we stop the experiment matters. So after eight hours, we get higher uh, conjugation proficiency than after four, simply because there's more time for the transconjugants to grow, um, which maybe within a single experiment is not so much of a problem, but becomes a problem if you want to compare results across the literature uh, and uh, obtained by different um, uh, labs and uh, for different incubation periods and things like that um, without the, the growth rates uh, mentioned of the strains involved you cannot really um, compare these things and, and measure them back. The second thing that we see and I think that's even more problematic here is that um, we would now infer we, we would draw the conclusion that our plasmid is transferring at a higher rate to the faster recipient and this is um, caused by the fact that clonal growth and horizontal transfer are confounded in this particular scenario because the um, recipient or the transconjugants are growing faster um, after the initial transfer into uh, these bacteria we just get more resulting transconjugants at the end of the line and this is being seen as some higher uh, level of conjugation proficiency. Luckily, this was already uh, seen as a problem um, back in the 90s by Lona Simonson et al, who developed a method um, based on uh, considerations of the population dynamics. So they effectively modeled what's happening in um, such a, a mating culture, uh, both these conjugation processes and growth processes going on. And they devised uh, what they call this endpoint um, formula with which you can uh, actually get the conjugation rate given uh, information on the um, uh, population growth rate of, of all of the um, strains together, as well as uh, measurements of the final population sizes uh, at, at the end of the experiment. So this is already really good because now there's no more dependence on uh, when you exactly terminate the experiment. Um, but we, and, and there's also some other advantages, like it doesn't depend on the initial densities uh, of um, the strains uh, as strongly anymore. Um, but what we still see, and it's a bit hard to see on this depiction, is that there's a, a slight difference depending on our, our growth rates, because effectively this method is taking into account one um, combined growth rate for all of the strains involved. So that's uh, one assumption that we relaxed. Um, simply by uh, allowing all of the different strains involved in uh, this process to have their own individual growth rates. And um, that means that you need to measure those individual growth rates. That's additional work for uh, an experimentalist. But um, with that, you also get more precise estimates. And we finally recover here that uh, in each of these treatments, uh, we actually had a plasmid conjugating at exactly the same rate. And very similar to the Simonson method, we basically derived what we call an endpoint formula. So um, you only need to measure sort of at the beginning and at the end of the experiment, and you don't need uh, measurements uh, all through time. So growth is one thing um, that can happen in these experiments, but another uh, thing that might be confounding our measurements of uh, the conjugation rate from these donors to the recipients is that at some point in the experiment, transconjugants are there in such appreciable numbers that they also start contributing um, to these conjugation events. And they might be conjugating at a different rate than the original donors. In fact, um, in other work together with Fabien Benz and Eric Bakkeren, um, we found that the donor identity strongly affects uh, the rate of plasmid transfer. And in this case, we had a, a first generation um, 
conjugation experiment, as we call it, from clinical donors into a recipient strain. And then we took the transconjugants resulting from that experiment and mated them together again with the same recipient strain in what we call a second generation uh, conjugation experiment. And we found that for this particular strain, uh, that difference was uh, two orders of magnitude. And now this is not um, a difference due to transitory derepression, but really due to uh, differences in strain identity and um, yeah, you can think, for instance, of, of different restriction modification systems and so on um, that, that are suddenly the same uh, now between um, the uh, new donor and, and the new recipient. So just to get back to our method to estimate plasmid conjugation rates, we don't actually um, remove this problem. We cannot say, OK, this is the donor conjugation rate estimate, and this is the uh, conjugation rate estimate from chance conjugants. But what we did manage to do is derive within uh, which time window you should measure the first experiment uh, so that it's not um, uh, troubled yet by the uh, contribution of transconjugants to this conjugation process, because initially they are at very low concentration as they are arriving in uh, the mating experiment, and it takes a while uh, until they start uh, dominating uh, what is visible in these cultures. So we um, developed an R package and a shiny app, so that's a web application um, that allows people to estimate uh, conjugation rates on their experimental data. Um, the idea behind it is that it should be as easy as possible to use. Um, I really hope that's the case, uh, but please, please um, try to use this if these are experiments that you carry out and, and let me know uh, what you think of um, yeah, the, the way this, this is usable and, and so on. Just send me an email or add an issue to this GitHub page. It would be very nice to, to know uh, how, how it's being experienced um, by those that, that are actually using it. So all of that was um, to say something about plasmid conjugation rates in vitro. But what does this actually mean for dynamics in more complex settings? Because um, as we've discussed also over the past few days in vitro, you're always um, looking at just one very um, specific situation. Um, and uh, in the environment, maybe the plasmids are, are experiencing a very different um, uh, surroundings and, and dynamics. And um, it's, I think, important um, to look at what the rates of plasmid transfer might be at um, these environmental levels, because this is exactly where we would want to intervene and uh, do something about surveillance, first of all, like in the hospital, which plasmids could be problematic, which plasmids are uh, spreading our antibiotic resistance from one type of bacteria to the other, um, but also which environments might be um, introducing resistance uh, or, or actually sort of absorbing uh, resistance and how can we uh, stop or like target those environments uh, where, where it's needed the most. So I don't have any answers to how to do this uh, the best, but I thought I would at least uh, mention a few different ideas um, in, in this direction that we can then um, uh, discuss further. So one thing is um, the translation of in vitro rates estimated for a very particular plasmid, maybe a very particular donor and recipient pair as well from in vitro to in vivo models. And again, in this study with Fabian Benz and Erik Bakkeren, uh, we did exactly that. We took um, two plasmids that we had previously conjugated in vitro uh, and put them into a mouse. And we found that qualitatively, um, we saw the same plasmid performing well in the mouse um, as we saw also in vitro and performing at a, a higher rate basically um, than, uh, than the uh, plasmid um, that was doing worse also in vitro. But we did not actually map the rates uh, onto each other because um, one problem, for instance, in, in doing this is that uh, we don't know whether the mouse gut represents a uh, well-mixed liquid environment. It probably does not. So there might be contributions of um, 
plasma transfer on surfaces, which we know for some plasmids happens at a different rate than uh, it does in liquid, for instance. Um, and, and also uh, a lot of the um, meeting dynamics. So the, the kinetics basically of which bacteria find each other and have the opportunity to mate is likely different in the guts than it is uh, in um, flasks or, or test tubes. So this is something where I think modeling can help in the future to try to describe those settings uh, more realistically. Additionally, um, there's evidence from other experimental systems uh, that this uh, translation from in vitro to in vivo on a qualitative level doesn't always work. So um, uh, this is from Lofty Eaton et al, where they uh, studied um, transmission in uh, zebrafish, and they actually found uh, different conjugation partners playing a role in vivo than in vitro, uh, simply because um, uh, of different abundances. So uh, I think in their in vitro experiment, uh, they didn't see one bacteria at all that was there in um, sort of low prevalence uh, in vivo uh, and actually played a, a large role uh, in the onward transmission or maintenance of this plasmid also because it was the host where the plasmid could persist better over a longer time. And I think that's another key uh, difference in translating in vitro results where often conjugation experiments take 24 hours, or maybe if you have slow growing strains, two to four days or so, versus in vivo, where we're really talking more on the scale of weeks to months uh, of this plasmid being present in a particular environment and also being maintained in a certain strain. Um, then secondly, there's this evidence from a uh, um, meta-analysis by Shepard et al. of just the sheer range of rates, conjugation rates that plasmids occupy. And here, this is all uh, as measured with the Simonson endpoint method. So in principle, it should be comparable uh, methodologically. And they find uh, plasmid um, transfer rates in vitro again, that's spread from 10 to the minus 16 to 10 to the minus eight. And more specifically for a single plasmid that's been used in many studies, R1, they find data points that span again from 10 to the minus 18 to 10 to the minus six, which is crazy. It's unheard of 10 to the minus 12 um, uh, or uh, 12 orders of magnitude difference for a single biological entity um, across different experiments. And I, I think we really need to find out as a community what is causing this. Is it just differences in um, experimental setup like uh, uh, mixing and again, uh, um, interaction possibilities between uh, conjugating partners, or is this all caused by uh, environmental factors and temperature and, and things like this, biotic factors. Um, and um, knowing better when a plasmid is at the bottom or the uh, top of its uh, possible range is gonna be really important for uh, predicting uh, spread also again in more complex environments. Um, yeah, and, and lastly, this is just because we have a lot of people interested in genomics here. Um, if we're thinking about um, genomics and the presence of a particular plasmid in a particular strain, um, and what that is telling us about the plasmid transfer rate, um, I, I think we're actually talking about something very different than when we're uh, approaching it sort of bottom up through in vitro measurements of plasmid transfer. And I would argue in a way that what we're observing through sequencing is um, maybe bringing us back to this very uh, beginning point of both growth and selection in particular environments, as well as plasmid transfer. Of course, we need the transfer to initially establish into a strain but then the fact that it can actually be observed there and uh, be present in high enough numbers to be picked up by some random sequencing study is probably because it's at least partially selected for. And um, I think this is also something that uh, we, we could potentially even target with um, specific sequencing studies and so on, whether we can try to disentangle uh, some of these effects more, maybe over shorter time scales, uh, or where also the uh, phylogenetic tree of, of the uh, chromosome of the bacteria that they're in has a lot of uh, temporal resolution, and the plasmid is just sort of jumping in and out, um, then you could start saying more about plasmid transfer rates.
So with that, I'm at the end. I really hope I didn't go too far over time. I, I lost kind of track of where we were. Um, I showed you this uh, paper that we wrote to um, estimate plasma transfer rates in vitro. I hope I could also uh, trigger some, some thoughts and, and discussion uh, about what we need to do to translate these rates into more complex settings. And that would be something that I would love to, to discuss with you more. Um, didn't do this all alone. I would like to thank uh, my supervisors, Tanya and Sebastian. I recently finished my PhD with them. I'm also looking for a postdoc position. So if anyone knows anything, please do let me know. Uh, and uh, I would be happy to answer questions. Wow, that was amazing. <laughs> so any questions for Jana? Uh, I don't think there are questions now. So what about we let Olivia talk? Because I don't have like questions on the talk, but I am up for the discussion. Uh, but maybe it's better if we let Olivia talk and then we, we discuss, I don't know. Olivia, are you here? I also see a, a question from Cornelia and- uh, Is there a question for Cornelia? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, it's also a quick question. So okay. uh, your transfer uh, experiments were always done in broth or were they done also in surface matings? Because it's a question of mixing. Because yes. in my lab, we typically do surface matings because they are more relevant for soil systems or plant systems. Mm -hmm. But you yes. use liquid, yeah? Yes, exactly. So this is all for uh, liquid media. And there's this nice paper that shows that under very, very particular uh, conditions, I think if you have a really high uh, density liquid and you put it on a filter for a very short amount of time, that it can still be roughly approximated. But there's, there's no real good measures that I currently know of uh, to do this on, on filters. And that's exactly part of this. Um, this discussion that I think we, we should have is how we can um, create measures that do take into account some of this spatial structure, for instance, this different interaction indeed, uh, mm -hmm. and um, maybe relate some of the transfer rates we measure on filters to those that you would get um, yeah, in, in liquids, for instance. Thanks. <laughs>